From here on, we'll proceed to the panel discussion session where our distinguished guests and panelists will share their views on the role of international collaboration in agricultural research to address the challenges in the post-COVID-19 global food system. May I remind our online participants that questions and comments are welcome during the session. Please use the Q&A function of Zoom and make sure to specify the name of the panelist to whom the question is addressed. However, due to time limitation, replies will be posted after the symposium in the JCAS website. So I think our panelists are now ready, and I'd like to give the floor to the chair of the panel discussion session, Dr. Masayoshi Saito, Director of Research Planning and Partnership Division of JCAS. Thank you for your introduction. I feel very honored today to chair this panel session, the modus operandi of international collaboration, with the distinguished panelists representing the organization engaged in agricultural development in the developing countries for decades. Please let me introduce the four panelists very briefly. First, Dr. Iwanaga, JILCAS president. He has almost 30 year experience in international agricultural research at various CGIAR centers. He has been engaged in guiding global strategies concerning the global food system with leading scientists in the world. Next, Mr. Sato, Vice President of JICA, is joining us today from here in Tsukuba. With his rich experiences in policy making and international cooperation at the ministry, he is now in charge of JICA's strategies of food, security, agriculture, and nutrition, among others. Next, uh, we have Dr. Marco Wopariz, Director General of World Vegetable Center. He has global expertise in leading agricultural science and management across diverse countries and regions in Asia and in Africa. Today, he is joining us from Taiwan. Dr. Sanginga is Director General of IITA, and today he is joining from Nigeria. He has extensive leadership, uh, ex leadership experiences in international research. IITA leads agronomy research of crops of high nutritional value and economic importance in tropical countries. Let me look back at the previous session. We had two keynote presentations on COVID-19 and the global food system. Dr. Schmidt's presentation highlighted rather surprising resilience of today's global food system in the supply of staple crops for cheaper calories against global shocks such as COVID-19. Yet as Dr. Iyama's presentation indicated, the COVID-19 has indeed revealed structural problems of the global food system in providing quality food within planetary boundaries. The global food system needs a fundamental trans transformation into a sustainable, equitable and resilient future. Now, the question is how we can achieve this goal through an effective mode of international collaboration. Let me ask each of the panelists for their opinions, the most critical areas of uh, in inventions for agricultural research in the post COVID-19 era. First, Mr. Sato, uh, JICA has an extensive presence in the developing countries, which has been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you see the impact of COVID-19 on the smallholder agricultural sector in developing countries? What is, in your opinion, the priority area of the post-COVID-19 interventions from the standpoint of a development, development agency, please. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Saito, uh, for very good. Uh, for uh, first of all, uh, uh, general uh, president, uh, general introduction, and also the very good questions, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I JICA see that uh, as uh, Mr. Schmidberg has pre pre has uh, presented that. Uh, uh, global agriculture and the food system has shown uh, surprisingly uh, remarkable resilience to this pandemic uh, if we looked at uh, the overall situation and also trade between countries. But uh, uh, when we look at the inside of each country, uh, we see some different uh, situation. Uh, according to a survey JICA conducted in August this year, uh, through a questionnaire in the country where it is carrying out its agriculture projects, uh, many countries uh, experienced uh, some confusion in the supply chain. And this uh, confusion caused, uh, in some countries, a decline in farmers' income and a rise in their spending, and also a rise in uh, food prices to a certain extent. Uh, in Asia, uh, these impacts seem relatively small and the situation is uh, now getting back to normal. But in Africa and uh, uh, some Latin American countries, uh, it is more serious, including its impact on agricultural production. Uh, in Africa, particularly, uh, a decline in sales volume of agricultural pro products is larger than in their production volume, uh, which indicates that farmers cannot sell their products even if they are harvested uh, because of this kind of supply chain disruption. There are also a decline in marketed volume and an increase in marketed prices of both agricultural products and materials such as seeds and fertilizers. And uh, many people are saying that, uh, are, are feeling that uh, their living performance are deteri deteriorated, uh, getting worse compared to three months ago. Uh, we are especially concerned that uh, in case farmers cannot afford to buy necessary agricultural materials uh, such as seeds and fertilizers, next year uh, the agricultural production will decrease. And that means more serious impacts on their livelihoods and also on food system and agriculture production than today. Furthermore, if this COVID-19 uh, pandemic continues in the future, like uh, second wave or the third waves, the whole economies of developing countries could be damaged. And those most affected will be poor and uh, vulnerable, vulnerable people in both rural and urban areas. So uh, as such, we see COVID-19 is affecting small farmers, especially in Africa and Latin America, and its impacts on food and agriculture could get worse in the future. So uh, we need to continue to look at the situation. And with regard to the uh, second question uh, from Dr. Saito uh, regarding the priority areas of intervention, I think we need to consider both short term and mid to long term. In the short term, it is critical, first of all, to make sure that uh, food and the nutrition are properly secured according to the circumstances of each country. Because as a head of the uh, World Food Program, uh, this year's Nobel Peace Prize laureate pointed out, until the day we have a medical vaccine, food is the best vaccine against the chaos. It is also necessary to secure livelihood food for farmers and secure stable agriculture production for the future. So based on such thought, I understand that uh, governments of many developing countries and development agencies, uh, including, including JICA, have taken such measures as provision of food or cash transfer for vulnerable people and uh, provision of agricultural materials such as seeds and fertilizers for small farmers as their urgent measures. And in the, with regard to the mid-term and long-term perspective, it is necessary to improve the resilience of food and agriculture system so that agriculture production and marketing are not disrupted 
as much as possible, even by such pandemics. Specifically, uh, this means providing support for farmers in building their capacities, including in uh, seed production and product storage. Also, development of rural infrastructures, especially transportation such as roads, is relevant in strengthening the supply chain. JICA has already engaged in these initiatives and will continue and expand them with more attention to the resilience. Finally, I would like to uh, emphasize the importance of addressing malnutrition in all its forms as a preventive measure against infectious disease such as COVID-19 and as a key to establishing a resilient society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saito. Sato. <laughs> so, now let me ask Jilka's president, Dr. Iwanaga, how do you perceive perceive the challenges of the global food system in view of the human and planetary health. In the longer term, with the projected demographic and socioeconomic trends, what do you think the most important area of actions or R4D to transform the current global food system for more resilient, environmentally sustainable and uh, nutri nutritionally desirable world. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Saito, uh, asking me a very big question, mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to reply within uh, five minutes. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I agree with um, uh, one of the keynote speakers' uh, presentation, uh, um, Dr. Uh, 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 Miyuki. Uh, Iyama, uh, but needs of a uh, uh, great uh, transformation of our current food system. Uh, she proposed to look into, uh, she uh, analyzed current system by contrasting uh, commercial scale uh, farmers versus uh, small scale holders. I would take a bit different approach, just uh, 60 degrees uh, difference. Uh, <laughs> that is, um, dissecting a global system by major food crops versus uh, locally important uh, crops. And uh, my suggestion is a, a change of a research priority of that uh, contrast. Uh, since the time of a Green Revolution in 60s and 70s, uh, we have successfully improved productivity of a globally important major staples such as uh, maize, wheat, and uh, uh, rice to meet with the ever-increasing uh, demands of uh, more foods, uh, catching up with uh, ever-increasing population and the shift of uh, uh, diets uh, towards more animal-based products. Uh, that is a great uh, success. On the other hand, uh, locally important crops, uh, such as uh, vegetables, uh, palaces, and the minor uh, cereals didn't get enough attention and the research investment. As one of the consequences, major staples have dominated our food system. And I would say, even at the expense of uh, other uh, locally important uh, crops, such as uh, vegetables. Uh, this is one of the main causes of uh, current uh, nutritional uh, uh, problems and uh, local uh, livelihoods. So we have to increase priority on locally important crops. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, we have to reduce uh, investment in uh, maize wheat. Uh, this is a former DG speaking. <laughs> so I'm not saying that, but we have to give a more uh, emphasis or priority and uh, investment to uh, minor uh, crops. Then uh, what we need to do? Uh, we need to change mode of our research and the development continuum and the partnership to address needs of uh, uh, locally important uh, crops. Locally important crops uh, need a local tailor-made approach to address uh, location uh, specificity rather than silver uh, bread 
a uniform global approach. How we can effectively interlink global research with a local research? That is a, a, this is a real a challenge. I believe that uh, it can be carried out only when we have an effective partnership among all concerned entities, uh, global research, local research, and development entities should be harnessed for its mode of collaboration to address location uh, specificity. Additionally, active use of uh, information communication technology should be explored as a potential tool to address efficiently uh, location specificity by uh, managing better. This part sounds like similar to uh, uh, Dr. Iyama. It is a um, uh, genotype, environment, management, and market interactions. I added market, even though I'm not an uh, economist. Uh, previous success of a global approach for major staple crops is based on minimization of uh, such interactions. Uh, maize genotypes are uh, selected in Iowa, uh, or uh, wheat genotypes selected in Mexico could have a potential of uh, immediate adoption in Africa uh, or uh, Asia. And those global organizations, uh, a good example is uh, CIMIT, uh, has already addressed how global operation can operate take advantage of a global operation uh, of uh, effectiveness and local adaptation by having a, a strong uh, regional uh, programs. I think we can learn from that. And the global approach uh, enjoys efficiency of our, our research. What we need now is to increase research efficiency for addressing a uh, uh, local uh, specificity. And I believe in a great potential of uh, information communication technology for that purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Iwanaga. Now I would like to invite Dr. Marco Wapariz. Dr. Wapariz, solving the triple burden of malnutrition is essential not only for the human welfare, but also for the us in the great food transformation. Given the limited resources available for agricultural R4D, what is your strategy as a DG of World Vegetable Center to relocate, reallocate, or boost investment in more nutritious, nutritious food and diet, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A uh, very good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you from Taiwan. <laughs> to start off, I would like to really thank Jerkas for inviting me to be part of this panel. The achievement of this institution, or as Koyama-san said, actually center over the last 50 years are truly impressive. Would like to congratulate Dr. Masa Iwanaga, Jerkas president, the entire staff for reaching this milestone, which Jerkas many more impactful years to come. Now, turning to your question, what is our strategy to boost investment for nutritious foods and diets? I think it's a very important one. The World Vegetable Center dedicates its entire research program to increasing the production and consumption of vegetables. And these are, of course, naturally rich in micronutrients. This year, our annual budget is about $20 million, which is clearly not enough to fulfill our ambition. The budget of the CG this year is uh, a lot larger, perhaps 40, 45 times larger. So let me make four points uh, related to our strategy to boost investment for nutritious food and diet. First of all, Will Vetch alerts the international donor community and national governments about the need to prioritize investment in nutritious foods through participation in fora like this one, through social media, publications, popular ones, scientific ones, including a much cited publication in Global Food Security in 2018 entitled Tapping the Economic and Nutritional Power of Vegetables. You can just Google that easily. <laughs> okay, secondly, 
to boost investment in nutritious foods, World Veg actively reaches out to the CGAR and other international centers in the Association of International Research and Development Centers for Agriculture, or ERCA in short, to get vegetables more prominently featured in R&D investment. There's clearly a need to diversify rice, wheat, maize, and tuber crop-based systems with more nutrient-dense crops. And we're very keen at the World Vegetable Center to work with a new one CGR to see how that can be done together and with many partners. I'd like to point out that rice farmers are often among the poorest in the country. How can we maintain rice production on a particular piece of land whilst enabling the rice farmer to earn more money by also growing some vegetables or other nutritious crops? How to help these farmers connect to markets? How can we stimulate active involvement of women and youth across vegetable value chains? Importantly, how to do all that in a sustainable manner with much increased efficiency of inputs, building natural capital, in particular, soil and health. Thirdly, I'd like to point out that it's really high time for a major international research initiative on vegetables. We need to accelerate the pace of progress in vegetable breeding and variety adoption. It's essential to conserve vegetable genetic resources, develop safe and sustainable production systems and also study how to stimulate consumer intake of vegetables because eating more vegetables is often not exactly automatic. And I believe that East Asian countries have a lot to offer to the world in terms of vegetable research and development expertise. Japan is among the top per capita consumers of vegetables in the world. What can we learn from Japan in terms of stimulating the supply and the demand for vegetables? How can we link with the vast networks Jerkas and JICA have all around the world to pilot and scale know-how and technology? The last point, Mr. Chairman, I want to make is about the need for public investment. Because often people argue that vegetables don't need public investment because the private sector is already there investing large amounts of money in research. Well, it's true that, for instance, seed companies are very active in vegetable breeding research but that's particularly for economically important crops such as tomato and cucumber. The World Vegetable Center is also working closely with the private seed sector in Asia and Africa, and in Asia has a collaboration with 44 seed companies at the moment. However, there are hundreds of important vegetable species, while only a few attract private sector investment. Maintaining the diversity of vegetables and conserving vegetable genetic resources and actively using them bringing them into food systems cannot be left to the private sector. Furthermore, there's a tendency for commercial vegetable production systems to use very high levels of external inputs, such as high amounts of mineral fertilizers and pesticides. So public investment will be needed to develop and promote more sustainable production methods which are important to protect human health and the environment. Last point around this importance of public sector investment is that another very important consideration is that many countries are experiencing a nutrition transition, a change away from traditional diets to its processed food items that are rich in fat, salt, and sugar. And the food industry is an important factor driving this transition. So there's really an urgent need to mobilize public investment to counter this trend and promote healthier diets in light of the rapid rise in diet-related diseases. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Weperis. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Sanginga. Dr. Sanginga, everyone in the audience should now agree the transformation of the global food system is urgent. Given the growing population in developing countries, the agricultural sector must be a driver of social transformation and an attractive livelihood option for younger generations at local, national, and regional levels. From IITA's perspective, how the agricultural sector can contribute to sustainable as well as inclusive, inclusive growth? Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, let me uh, first of all con congratulate um, uh, Jirkas uh, 
uh, for uh, the 50th anniversary. And uh, I would like to say I cherish uh, the cooperation we've been having between GIRCAS and IITA. And uh, thanks uh, to Masa. Um, well, I miss Japan because every two years I have to come to Japan. Uh, now, um, let me address uh, what I consider to be the new challenges in Africa about the question you've asked. Uh, Africa today imports almost $35 billion a year worth food. And uh, strange enough, we import most of the time what we can produce locally. We think about rice, for example. And if we don't do anything, by 2025, it's going to be $110 billion. What it means, if the rice eaten in Africa has to be produced in Thailand, it means that we are creating jobs in Thailand, while here in Africa, the unemployment rate is about 90% in some, 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 some countries. It's ironic. The second problem, the active farmers in Africa are 63 years old. The people like me, uh, this is the farmers. Now you can imagine when they are in the village. So there is a gap, there's a very serious gap of almost 30 years of uh, the active farmers and the young people who are not interested in agriculture. And the youth unemployment is uh, about uh, probably to 60% and 70% in Africa. This is really dramatic. The third point, uh, agriculture uh, in Africa for a long time has been considered that the social sector uh, depends on uh, donors' aid to develop agriculture. And uh, you see some government, uh, governments in, uh, in some certain countries don't even have a policy for agriculture. And uh, we are submitting that agriculture is, is to be a business to attract uh, not only the private sector, but to attract uh, the young people. Now, the story of uh, the youth in agriculture at ITA is as follows. In, 20, in 2012, when I became a DG, uh, on one um, Monday, I was going to work, and I heard there was a riot in front of ITA gate. And I went uh, to the gate to see what was happening. There was almost around 500 young people fighting to come and do the job of uh, casual work, uh, working in the field of cassava in ITA. So I was really curious to know why they were coming, who they were. And I started interviewing those young people. I spent almost four hours interviewing all of them. And I was asking this simple question, why are you here? As the answer was said, no, I don't have a job. I'm coming to look for some money, you get $6 per day. So are you a graduate? Oh, yes, I'm a graduate of computer sciences, University of Ibadan. I'm a graduate of uh, history, um, uh, quantity surveying. So all of them had a degree, some three years, five years after the finish without a job. So I uh, picked a sample of 60, and I said, OK, uh, come to my office. And uh, I sat down with them. 50% ladies, 50% young men of different discipline, where basically we decided that uh, we want to start a program of the youth uh, because I'm trying to convince them that agriculture, and especially when you consider this kind of value chains, uh, could be uh, the future for uh, job. And as a matter of fact, we started the program, which was centered on three pillars. First of all, we wanted to have uh, to link them to technologies which uh, could be of interest uh, to the young people. Just uh, to talk about our cooperation with CGIRCAS, uh, the uh, YAM technology uh, was uh, extremely interesting. And today, you have uh, young people who are making uh, YAM bread, they are making YAM cake, they are making, uh, and they are selling even seeds, uh, YAM seed, because everybody want to produce yam now in Nigeria. And those are technologies we work together with JIRCAS. JIRCAS or J Japan has invested a lot of uh, time and money in this technology. Those are technologies were very attractive to the young people. 
and of course the digital technologies as well. That was the, the first pillar, training, linking them to the technology. The second one was uh, to basically initiate a, a kind of business training for them where they were able to make um, a business plan and uh, then making sure that they could come up with innovative startup. And we started that program at ITA using the ITA resources for 12 months. And uh, after 12 months, it was uh, quite successful. I think 70% of those young people had started their business and uh, in a different uh, area or aquaculture, vegetables and, and so on. And then I invited uh, the African Development Bank to come and examine the program. And uh, yes, Adesina, he was then the president. Uh, he came to IITA. And uh, we launched uh, the program, which was called Youth Program, and uh, with uh, ADB. And uh, just to cut uh, short the story, uh, this program has been scaled uh, down in 24 countries in Africa now. And it's based on uh, the pillars that um, the, the technology, business plan, and startup that we started at ITA. And uh, basically, we see now government, uh, Department of Finance is uh, borrowing money for the, from the bank to start a similar program and addressing the issue of uh, the young people and using agriculture as an entry point. I would like to say, if uh, we don't succeed in doing this, we see uh, just uh, two weeks ago, there was almost a revolution in Nigeria where the young people uh, block the country from two, two weeks because they don't have jobs and so on. And um, basically the government has contacted ITA to revive again and uh, scale that program uh, up because it seems to be very essential. So I would like to stop uh, here and concluding that uh, yes, uh, it's possible to change the mindset of the young people uh, in Africa toward agriculture, especially if it's driven by good technologies and uh, yeah, for the moment, the, 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 the dry driven by the digital world. Uh, so let me stop here and uh, maybe is there are some questions I would like to answer some questions. Thank you, Dr. Sandinga. Thank you. Thank you all the panelists for your views on strategic area of agricultural research and the development in <coughs> In, uh, development interventions for the post-COVID-19 era. Now, let us discuss how best we will implement these strategic research and development on the ground. Jilkas has had a 50-year experience of international collaboration. In turn, these days, challenges affecting the global food system, including climate emergencies, pandemics, economic flowout, are emerging too fast on one hand. On the other, the developments of technologies and innovations are also evolving at the accelerated rate. We need to look for an effective modernity, moda uh, effective modality of operation or international collaboration to tackle the global challenges more effectively. What do you expect the international collaboration, especially between research institutions and implement, implementing, uh, sorry, implementing agencies to address the challenges affecting the post-COVID-19 global food system? Question is, what is the best way or modality of operation? First, I would like to ask Mr. Sato again. Would you tell us some more about achieving impact through your approaches. So time is limited, so please, within okay. two minutes. Few minutes, okay, I, I, I'll try. Uh, thank you for another very, very important question. Uh, from the viewpoint of uh, one of the ODA implementing agencies, uh, the collaboration with uh, research institu institutions such as GILCAS is uh, very uh, important. Uh, it allows us to advance uh, scientific approach in addressing uh, such challenges as uh, promoting pro productivity of rice farming and addressing malnutrition in Africa. 
uh, because uh, research institutions can provide uh, scientific information and uh, specific technologies that can be used for development assistance. Uh, on the other hand, all the uh, agencies like us are uh, in a better position to uh, be familiar with, spe with specific needs in many uh, developing countries. So uh, we have to, we are already in partnership, but uh, we have to think uh, of a uh, uh, way to strengthen our partnership. And uh, uh, with regard to the modality of uh, such collaboration for the future, uh, first, uh, it would be useful uh, as a starting point to exchange the information and views between the research side and the development side, including uh, the headquarter level. And this will help them to share common goals and identify specific areas, countries, and even projects of collaboration. And uh, uh, in the field of project level, uh, one of the best way is that uh, we think that uh, carefully selected partners, including research institutions and uh, ODA implementing agencies, work together from the early stage of research in a framework where the research products or the technologies are to be implemented immediately in specific local context. Uh, although the time is limited, let me e e share uh, with you one recent good practice. Uh, in a JICA rice project conducted in Colombia, we made partnership uh, not only with the government agencies and research institutions, but, only, but also with the country's rice producers organization. Uh, so in uh, this project, uh, those people who will actually use those technologies, those who will have to deliver this technology directly to local farmers, were deeply involved from the early stage of the research. Uh, this project uh, successfully developed new technologies and uh, some, uh, new uh, fertilizer application and the new methods of uh, rice cultivation. And uh, they have been highly evaluated by uh, Colombia's, not only Colombia's government, but also by uh, the local farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Dr. Wipperis, would you tell us more about world-based experience in global food system? please. Uh, and maybe, thank you, Mr. Chairman, maybe to come quickly back on COVID-19. I think it has shown the fragility of our food systems, in particular for nutritious food, because these foods are by nature highly perishable. And I think there's clear evidence for that in low-income countries in South Asia and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. And World Veg has conducted surveys with 500 farmers by phone uh, somewhere in April, May, clear evidence of uh, uh, income loss uh, for these vegetable farmers. They just couldn't get the products to the market. So I think there's really a need to pay much closer attention to local approaches to stimulate demand and supply of nutritious food and especially near urban center. And this work will be very context specific and complex. And there will be a need to look at both demand for and supply of nutritious food. I think this also what Dr. Iwanaga said uh, in his opening remarks when he talked about the need work on location-specific futures tailored to meet specific needs. I think that's very important. And I would advocate for international collaboration around food systems pilots, where research is conducted in a development setting, bringing together research institutions and implementing agencies. But this would mean doing research in development rather than research for development and conducting impact-oriented research in real-life food system settings and in close interaction with key policy and decision makers to ensure their buy-in and support, often local policy and decision makers. Focus of these food systems pilots must be on nutritious food and how to make these high value and perishable commodities, commodities more affordable, accessible, acceptable, and available to all consumers, rich or poor, across wealth classes. Food systems pilots can then be linked with more thematic research upstream to leverage best know-how and technology available globally and with public and private sector development efforts to scale out results in comparable settings nearby. International collaboration around such food systems pilots would provide, I think, an interesting opportunity to exchange experiences and move forward together. I think also very important is that everything is going faster and faster nowadays, so we need to do a much better job in integrating digital technology and big data in our research work and in knowledge exchange. 
to ensure that we always take accurate and timely decisions and that we can provide optimal guidance based on the best available knowledge out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. Now, Dr. Sanjinka, would you tell us about IITA's experiences and some of the activities of CGIL, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to share with you my experience of last time when I was in Japan. So I went to visit uh, this uh, yam factory when they're processing yam, and uh, it looks like um, that factory sell almost 60% of the yam that is consumed uh, in Japan. And uh, it was really quite interesting because uh, we produce most of the yam in Africa here in Nigeria, but we don't transform it and we don't commercialize it. We will commercialize it in the market and so on. So that was really my big learning, and I invited uh, the owner of uh, the factory to come to Nigeria. And um, yeah, because of COVID-19, uh, well, they couldn't make it. But uh, I just wanted them to share uh, the experience and try to see how um, the massive yam we are producing could be transformed the way it is being done in Japan. That was really excellent. But after visiting the factory, we went to the field, uh, to the field where yam was planted in the village around the factory. And uh, it was quite interesting, uh, the seed system uh, there in Japan was uh, just like, uh, uh, it was not as much advanced as the seed system that we have in IIT. Uh, they were using still, they were used still using uh, yam mini set, while uh, uh, with our colleague, uh, Jirkas, the Japanese scientists have developed a system here that uh, we're using uh, now leaflet, uh, we are using uh, uh, the new technology to produce the yam uh, system in uh, must then I could see how uh, the, the exchange between uh, the technologies IT could uh, be so useful for that um, private sector in Japan and uh, how the private sector in Japan could influence and even create business based on yam here in, in Africa. That was uh, really extremely interesting, and uh, I'm sure I would like uh, to pursue that. Uh, so talking about um, as a new CGR system, we are entering a very difficult uh, phase of reform in a, in a CG. Uh, it's not clear yet, uh, but, uh, um, and I'm sure Massa has, uh, knows about the reform in the CG. Uh, Marco knows about it <laughs> as well. Uh, so uh, it's not clear, but what is really very important uh, for, 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 for me and for IIT is that uh, we've developed uh, another arm of uh, research on uh, uh, basically the research for delivery. Uh, because we realize that, uh, yes, doing research um, uh, has been being passed to NGOs and the uh, private sector. Uh, that model has not worked very much. So at ITA, we've developed uh, a partnership for development where basically we are creating some business incubation, which the private sector is really picking up and is run with it. An example of that would be the Aflasef, um, technology that we've developed that is being commercialized in uh, 35 countries in Africa for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I would like to ask Dr. Iwanaga to give us your comment on the functions of JIRCAS as a connecting point of network of actors and your overall comments on this final session, please. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm supposed to uh, conclude that within time, it's already passed. Mm. <laughs> um, what I felt uh, attending uh, today's uh, 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 symposium, uh, we uh, who are involved in the um, issues of uh, uh, food and agriculture, uh, we are not uh, uh, good at uh, communicating with uh, uh, public or other sector because uh, uh, we see uh, the problems on the ground, farmers field and so on, and we like to get things done instead of just talking. That's the way we, uh, we grown up uh, professionally. Uh, however, 
uh, now we have to realize importance of communication. Uh, even within uh, sector of uh, agriculture research and the development, by uh, communicating, we realize uh, opportunity of a uh, collaboration. And also, uh, we have to communicate better to other uh, sector who are working on uh, environment and the health, and also even other sectors such as a private sector. Uh, we are not uh, s uh, spending enough effort in a communication because uh, we want to get things done instead of just talking. Uh, so that is our uh, attitude, and we have to uh, change a little bit and give more emphasis on importance of uh, communicating with uh, other uh, sectors, uh, health, environment, and so on, because uh, 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 to change global food system, uh, it is not a change of uh, food and agriculture. It's much bigger than that. And also, we need to get uh, much better attention from uh, public and uh, uh, public investment. Uh, we cannot uh, obtain that without our uh, uh, communicating better with uh, 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 public, uh, general public and the public sector, uh, including uh, uh, donor uh, agencies. So uh, I feel that uh, uh, today's uh, uh, symposium uh, attained uh, objective of uh, providing a platform of uh, communication, uh, different parts of the world and a different sector. And then, as a conclusion, uh, what I like to say that uh, uh, we have to uh, improve uh, our effectiveness uh, in communication uh, within uh, food and agriculture research sector, but also with uh, other sectors environment and health, and also uh, general public and uh, donor agencies for the importance of uh, agriculture and the food. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for all the panelists for sharing your valuable opinions. Unfortunately, it is time to close the session. I hope this session helped the participants think about how we can achieve the goal to settle structural problems of the global food system through an effective mode of international collaboration. Thank you all the participants for your contribution to the session, and I deeply appreciate all the panelists' input. So thank you very much, and please give them a big hand. <laughs>